Hey Rick, it's Max. Hey Max, oh is it 440 already? Uh, I, I don't know, it's five, no, we're a little bit early, we're half an hour early. Is that okay? Uh, you start now? Yep. We are talking, and this is being filmed on, the traditional ancestral lands of the Beotuk and the Mi'kmaq. Uh, this university and this lab also works in the larger province of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, where we recognize the people of Nunatukavut, Anunnatsiavut, and the Innu Nation as the ancestral people of this land. My name is Dr. Max Liberant. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Geography at Memorial University, and I study plastic pollution. Hello, Max speaking. As far as I'm concerned, the real only uh, mode of attack is to deal with the heavy decrease in the production of plastics, as opposed to dealing with them after they've already been created. Your consumer behaviors do not matter, not on the scale of the problem. On the scale of personal ethics, yes. But recycling has, has sort of skyrocketed, especially since the 70s. And if you look at the graph I brought, recycling skyrocketing resulted in nothing, no impact on the scale of plastic production whatsoever. We can do all we want at end of pipe. And in some cases that's very necessary, but really it's the cessation of production that'll make the big scale changes. Is it correct to think that recycling doesn't really represent a solution to the problem of single-use plastic? Absolutely, recycling is like a Band-Aid on gangrene. Thank you for that insight. I mean, what do you think the Canadian government should be doing more broadly about, about that challenge? Uh, if I was king of Canada, uh, it would be to, to remove subsidies from oil. So all plastics start as organic matter in prehistoric eras, usually under the ocean, pressed down, right? That's where oil, natural gas comes from. So that's the very first birthplace. And a lot of the extraction of that, those legacies are, are plastic legacies as well. After that process from crude oil or natural gas into plastic, it moves usually into consumer items, but of course, if you skip to the end, eventually it'll end up in the ocean where it's shredded almost immediately into microplastics. What I do is I poke around in different environments, surface of water, under the water, and increasingly in food webs, and I look for very small plastics so I can report back what types, what amounts, how they relate to the rest of the world, and what we should be concerned about in this province. A lot of the science, the vast majority of pollution science, is about locating the threshold of pollution where harm doesn't occur, and then you let industry pollute up to that level, and then on you go. And so I really want to inject a type of output, regardless of what people know about this lab, that does not reproduce the violence of threshold limits and allowable limits of harm. We are an activist lab, a scientific lab, and we in particular were an anti-colonial and feminist marine science laboratory. We specialize in marine plastic pollution. I think from an organizational perspective, it's hard to operate a lab like this within a framework designed to foster a different type of science. I was a part of other labs before and it was a very different atmosphere coming in. Even to my friends saying, I work in this lab and we do feminist anti-colonial methods in science. And people understand it to a point, but then it's like, how do you do that in science? Like, what does that even mean? If you lead with like, we're a feminist anti-colonial lab, only certain people will want to hear what happens after that sentence. Uh, so often I don't lead with that. <laughs> There's certain very fundamental elements about a colonial knowledge pursuit in general, and certainly applies to science, maybe, maybe in a way more intensely than almost any other field. Uh, and one is that there's a universality to it. Like when you discover something scientifically, it applies to anything, anywhere. You know, you could go anywhere in the world and it's like, yes, this works, this is what truth is. Truth was here in this place and truth is the same someplace else, right? For us, that's so far from our truth, that's so far from, from our knowledge as Indigenous people. We know that knowledge, you must understand where you are. 
Every time you decide what question to ask and not to ask others, which counting style you use, which statistics you use, how you frame things, where you publish them, who you work with, who you get funding from, all of that is political. It means that some things will be reproduced and some things won't be. Reproducing the status quo is deeply political because the status quo is super crappy. Max is my goddaughter, my beloved goddaughter. The most important thing is that she is taking the most essential, the most central values and knowledge of us as indigenous people, and she's ap applying that into the work she's doing in the lab on a, on a very day-to-day -day basis, not a theoretical basis. The number one rule of the lab is that if you're tired, exhausted, heartbroken, etc., you go home. It's also really important that we do a consensus so everyone has to agree. And also, we don't privatize anything. A lot of my research involves making what is usually called citizen science, but might also be called anti-colonial tools for monitoring plastics. Do you want to see? You That's okay. See? It's very nice. I drilling experience. I know, I don't know that I haven't drilled really ever. Well then you should, you should start with the countersink. <laughs> You'll never go back. So there's a few different scientific instruments we've made. Baby legs was my first invention. She's made with baby tights and she's a surface trawl. And the other one is Lady, the low-tech aquatic debris instrument. She's a bigger trawl. Lady is, by the way, named in direct opposition to the Manta trawl, which is the scientific standard. Manta trawl costs 3,500. Lady costs $500. Baby legs is about $12. So those are, those are equitable tools. They were built so that Rural folks in Newfoundland who don't have grants or institutions or reliable electricity can build them. Perfect. What we at? Two knot? So it's right, this little yellow piece right there. Oh yeah, some ducks. This part of Newfoundland, which is where I do most of my studies and where a lot of people depend on you know, wild food. What we're sampling is not fish in the ocean. What we're sampling is human food webs. And some are easy to tell that they're plastic, right? Because they're blue or green or shaped sort of weird. But some of them are, are much harder to find, like figure out. Like, so is that thing over there plastic? The blue one on the right is probably a sparkle from toothpaste. It's like, that's how small we're talking. That's a very, very, very small bug next to it. Um, and this one, there's three sizes of microbeads in one face wash. So when plastics enter the ocean, they act like a sponge and they absorb the oily chemicals that are around them in the water. Things like PCBs, flame retardants, methylmercury, and those glom onto the plastics. The tobacco colored ones, these are older. You can tell they're also like more beat up. It's sort of like tobacco teeth. The more you smoke, the more your teeth turn that color. Same color, same phenomenon. You're absorbing chemicals into it. And when an animal ingests that, we get worried about those chemicals moving into the food web. Ready to do one? There's a very simple protocol in our lab where you don't wear earbuds when you're dissecting a fish because that separates you from the fish. You can listen to music and the radio and you can sing all you want. In fact, that would be preferable. But you, but you don't get to be separate from your, your, the relation that you're dissecting. It assumes you're not better than the fish. It means you're respecting the fish for what it's doing for your research, the value it's adding. It's your relation. That's the core. That's the core of who we are as a people. 
um, to be relational. And so there's particular protocol, there's particular ways in which you, you go about um, honoring those relations and, and, and continuously understanding those relations. Spread, wash, put it aside. That'll go in the bag to go back to the land. Are you ready for us? Yeah, yeah. And, and where are you again? We're in a place called Petty Harbor, which is a fishing village about 20 minutes away from St. John's. And we thought it was a good place because there's already a well-developed gut economy here where fishermen, including commercial fishermen who have a lot of guts, throw their guts into the water all the time. So I feel like part of what we're doing too is like, you know, tossing a fish in a dumpster and incinerating it is a severing of ties in a certain way and a, and a lack of acknowledgement. Well, this is sort of the acknowledgement of what's sacred and what's sacred is how we're all connected. So my impulse is to like go to the edge of the water with some, maybe some, I, so I laid down tobacco. I don't burn anything usually when, like for hunting stuff. Um, but we could also, we could smudge. We could take all the medicines down and use all of them and say some nice things to the fish in the water, which might be your job, Rick. Because yep. um, you're the best at that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, how's that sound? I think that sounds good. That sounds like the way to go about just lay down your tobacco and um, and everybody as they approach, just be in prayer, as I'm sure you are, you are already. Yep. Relations are always a, a very intimate. Intimate in the way that it has to be mutually shared. There has to be a communication that goes on that cannot be interrupted by, by something that, that isn't part of that relation, like a, like a camera, for instance. Okay, we will do that, and we'll stop filming now then. Uh, so everything yeah, else from here on in is for, uh, not for public consumption. All right. Okay, let's get some guts.